Coach Schumann here for the Successful Life Podcast. We're with a new special guest this week, Lance Growlick. Um, Really excited to talk to him about a topic that we haven't really covered that often on the podcast. We've covered a lot of different things in business. Um, we've, we've covered how to grow your business in a short time period, 90 days. We've, we've, we've talked drop shipping. We've talked, um, uh, how to be an entrepreneur and build your business from scratch. Today, we're going to talk a topic that most people have some interest about, or maybe even know a few things about, or even curious about, but there's a big divide between the haves and the have nots on this and who knows and who doesn't know. And Lance is here to really, really fill it, and that's franchising. Um, how to really be able to to become a franchise owner, how to build your business there, uh, how to go about that whole entire process. And there's no better person than Lance. He's built Ion Franchising. Um, he's been in the business so really early on in his career, and he like like me, he's got a couple of grays in the beard. That's part of uh, co- co- keeping in co- <laughs> inside of COVID and during the whole this whole COVID time period, and, uh, uh, and not having to see as much people. So you have to forgive us. At least we're aligned and alike in our beard. So <laughs> that part's good. Uh, I want to beard brotherhood. Up. That's it. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Lance. Thank you, thank you, Coach Dave. Nice to see you. Yeah, it's great. It's great to have you on. And and, and I think it's so uh, it, this to me is one of the, the most interesting topics of all the topics that we've discussed, like like we kind of talked about in the pre area. I just don't know that much about it. Right. So yeah. um, and I've been a business owner since 2003. And, and I can honestly say I know very little to almost nothing about about franchising. And it's something that at the same time is I've always been interested in and wanted to know more. So when when it came across and and, and, and uh, we wanted to get you on the podcast, I was like, ah, this is a golden opportunity. <laughs> so t- tell everybody a little bit about uh, um, your company and uh, kind of where you where you come from and how, how you got into this process and uh, absolutely a little bit about that. Well, look, I was I was raised in New York. I grew up in a you know I call it a Wall Street family. Dad was was on Wall Street, and I I uh, pursued that initially, but uh, I didn't like sitting in an office all day at that time. At that that age, I got had just had my got my economics degree, and uh, had an opportunity with a family uh, very close family friend who made his money in tech and wanted to build a a huge restaurant franchise. And I had worked in bars and restaurants, and I got my my hands dirty throughout college. I uh, love, love the people aspects of the business. So I moved to Phoenix, Arizona, Paradise Valley, Scottsdale. We built a TGI Fridays franchise from nothing to about $225 million a year. And uh, 60 plus stores, we were the largest franchisee of TGI Fridays. But that's where I got bitten by the franchising bug. I said, well, this is pretty incredible. They do all the R&D. They're, they're making sure that we're on top of how to sell, how to merchandise, recipes, uh, food costs, total cost of goods. They, they really teach you how to manage a, a business. And obviously, we had our spin on it with hiring certain people, and they don't necessarily control the, the people side of it or the HR side uh, of it. But I, I got bitten by the franchise bug. And fast forward many years to today, I mean, I've, I've done all kinds of franchise development for small emerging brands. Um, as the internet became a big thing, uh, how many years ago now? You know, 10 years ago. Um, franchising changed. Uh, in the old days, it was purely franchise shows and, and, and magazines or mail order, if you will. And you get a book of franchises in the mail and you flip through these opportunities and, you know, old fashioned phone call uh, and leave a message for somebody and they get back to you and nobody was texting. But nowadays, it's all about technology. Franchise consultants like myself, uh, you know, I, I work for free on the search side. I help people find their dream business. And the beauty of it is today, instead of people at midnight deciding they hate their job, they want to leave the corporate world, let's let's start, you know, hunting and pecking, so to speak, for the franchise of their choice in the middle of the night. And 50 different business folks call because you've inquired about a franchise. I'm your one-stop shop to help people find their perfect franchise. So, uh, but over the years, I've been a Wingstop franchisee. I've been a Krispy Kreme franchisee in different states. Uh, I've done really well with that franchisee of the year. Um, I've been president of Franchise Advisory Councils 
Um, I advise uh, private equity groups on uh, certain franchise arenas, especially the restaurant sector. I've created several of my own brands, a now famous donut brand in Las Vegas that's uh, ranked one of the top donut shops in the United States. I'm even helping a Food Network star as we speak with a new donut shop in Las Vegas now that my non-compete has expired. Uh, it's going to be called Wicked, and Wicked's coming soon to Las Vegas. So I'm a serial entrepreneur that realized that the franchising world is a wonderful, wonderful world for an average person that simply, like myself, like I was, simply wanted to get in the business, not by themselves, but for themselves. And the reality is with franchising, you have a system, you have support, you have a proven brand. You can even, we have a process called validation where you as a prospective franchisee can actually call other franchisees through the brand's uh, directory, if you will. You'll have permission from the brand to uh, contact folks. And, and get a certain level of validation to make you feel comfortable that you're going to fit into the culture uh, of this particular brand. And what does the day to day look like? You know, what have you. So that's the uh, high level highlights. Hopefully that answered that. Uh oh, I lost the sound for a second. That's, the, that's I'm back. That, that, that's fantastic. Um, uh, how does someone, when they want to go into the the, the franchising space, um, they they think they want to, you know, they want to leave that job or they want to go into um, uh, a new business there, um, and they don't want to take on being an entrepreneur as themselves, but they want to go and they want to start their own uh, thing, but they want to get someone else's process. What is some of the ways that they go about doing that and 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 how do you help them with that process? Well, great great question. The first where it, where it all starts is I get people that call me through referrals, friends I know or or clients I've already placed with a franchise. I also do quite a bit of lead generation to uh, you know, get people that are interested in being an entrepreneur. Typically those folks are in one of two categories. They really want a certain type of business, let's say a restaurant, because maybe they worked in their family pizza shop, but now they want to do their own thing and they're comfortable with the restaurant business. So that's their set. I find them a restaurant. I have about 190 restaurants that I represent. But then I have the other people that don't necessarily have an idea. I'm working with a high school friend right now. He retired from the corporate world, 28 years in the same corporate type job, made some money, and he just wants to make money. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I mean, that's why we all get into business. We want to make money, have our own freedom and independence. So, you know, after I have at least a 15-minute conversation, sometimes it's much longer, to assess everything from what is the desired investment level? What is your current financial situation? I mean, is this something you're going to do full time as an owner operator? Are you going to be an, a semi absentee owner? I have a, a family friend that owns 19 hair salons, 19. Now, initially, he had to work hard. They're franchised. He had to work really hard at his first or second store. And then at some point, his team took over where he didn't have to be there every day. He doesn't have to cut hair anyway. He doesn't even have hair, by the way. He's not even his own customer. But he knew it was a good business to make to make money. Now he works probably five to 10 hours a week on his 19 salons, and that's it. So it starts with the first call. I have something on my website called the Business Builder Profile or Assessment, and it'll, it'll clue me in and the person filling out the information. It'll take 10 minutes, maybe 15 tops, and it'll talk about, it'll give me uh, what you are most compatible with based on your skills and actually your mindset, it'll even talk about, to me, the comfort level that somebody has. So someone that doesn't have, well, that has too big of a comfort level, they're not going to want a newer, hot emerging brand. They're going to want something a lot more established where the risk is absolutely minimal. You know, And if a brand has 3,000 locations, I guess you can say the risk could be more minimal because uh, it's more of a proven, established, tenured brand. And uh, we go through a series of phone calls. I go through a presentation process based on the, the first phone call. And I present brands to folks. Two minutes at a shot, talk about a brand. People start in their head filtering through, 
oh, I can see myself doing that, or no, I'm not interested in that. And uh, that's totally fine. And at some point, there's some brands that float surface, and people say, you know what, Lance, can you introduce me to that brand? And then that's what I do. Behind the scenes, I do an introduction to the brand, and then the first phone call with that brand manager. And all brands have a fairly similar process. And, 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 and keep in mind, franchising is a two-way street. It's, it's almost like a marriage, but it's a business marriage. No franchisor wants to get in bed, so to speak, with someone they don't like. You know, um, and, and the bottom line is it's a two way street. You have to like each other. You have to feel good about each other because you're going to be doing business together for quite a quite a number of years. A typical franchise agreement is 10 years and they're typically automatically renewable in the event you're not in a default. So it's a long term generational relationship. There are McDonald's franchisees that are already on third generation. So. Well what what are characteristics like when you advise someone that that comes to you and says hey i'm interested in in you know owning a franchise but i have no idea you know like you, you, w w what to do uh how, how do you advise them as far as what might be the right fit for them um and, and how do you kind of guide them through that that process like what what are what are the most important characteristics that you look for at someone that wants to be a franchise owner? Great. That's a perfect question. And, you know, a lot of it starts with, again, investment level and, and what they are they going to be the owner operator? So there are some brands that you cannot do if you're going to be an absentee or semi absentee owner, meaning eh, I'm not really going to be there every day. I'll go through training and I'll help, but I'm going to put a manager in place. Well, typically that won't work for a group of brands. Certain brands have to be an owner operator. Other brands, they will allow um, uh, a distanced owner, call it semi absentee or absentee. So then it gets into, well, what are your abilities? Sales is a big thing. There are some brands that are more of a consulting type, whether it's business consulting or uh, anything where it takes somebody with sales ability. So some people, a guy that's an IT guy might not want a franchise where he has to be face to face with customers and selling them any kind of services. Um, so you start to understand the brand attributes versus the skills of the person. And then I call it the, uh, the trying on method, you know, because some people, everybody has an investment level. Everybody has income desires. And you start to match them up, and then all of a sudden, brands start to feel good to certain people, you know. Um, so that's that's the quick gist of that. What well, what can someone expect? So, um, you know, I decide that you know you consult with me, and I decide that I want to go through this process. What can I expect to happen um, once I take on a franchise? So, for example, like I know some people that own franchises. And they're looking, you know, they they come from Wall Street and they got a big, big pockets and they want someone to run it. And then yep. there are other people that like my local Dunkin Donuts franchise owner, he is literally there every single day. Um, he owns a few of them, but he's there every single day for a certain period of time, literally in the midst of it. Um you know, what what can I expect? Well, what what are some of the things that make a franchise owner most successful? Yeah, good. Well, you know, first of all, with the restaurant owners, you mentioned a lot of people know restaurants to be what franchises are. I have probably, I have hundreds of categories of franchises. Overall, in the restaurant space, you know, as long as you have, you mentioned the Wall Street guy. The Wall Street guy, when I was with Krispy Kreme, the Wall Street type guy, the professional, the attorneys or what have you, the big finance guys, they would bring in an operator. They give the operator a piece of equity, normal franchise relationships. They want an owner to have at least 10% equity in the company, if it's uh, some form of sweat equity. But you know, 10% equity is normally the barometer. It could be 15% for some brands. And, and they'll go to training and bring a manager with them. The actual owner doesn't necessarily have to go to training. And you know, Again, that two-way street, if the brand believes in you and believes in your team and what you bring into the table and you have enough of the capital to inject, 
especially if you have a multi-unit development agreement where you have the ability to build in your example of Dunkin Donuts, you know, you're going to do a 10 unit deal with Dunkin. They know at some point you as the owner are not going to be behind the counter. Someone else has to be doing that. So that's where the McDonald's brands and Dunkin Donuts and Wendy's were built in the early days. So that is the beauty of the franchise system. There's online training, there's face-to-face -face training, there's franchise business consultants that go in the field to support in the openings, as well as a full training team if it's your first store. So franchises are built to give a, a complete and full level of support. It's, it's really interesting because it's such a, a wide range of ways to do it. Um, when when they come to you um, and you you start consulting with them and you're starting to fit, you know find a good fit for them, what is some of the advice that you give them uh, with interacting with the uh, um, the franchisee, I guess. Uh, yeah, franchise, well, yeah. franchise or franchisor, right? Franchisor. franchisor. <laughs> we call we call them Zors versus Zs. Yes, yes. So the franchisor is the is the company that's yeah. franchising. Got it. And, and and these these individuals, I call them candidates or clients. They're prospective franchisees. Uh, you know, I'll give you a perfect live example of what you're talking about. Uh, I have a gentleman that's a, a CPA, certified public accountant. He's a professional man, 20, 20 people in his office, uh, big responsibilities. He owns quite a bit of real estate and shopping centers. He has a specific need in a few of his shopping centers. And he wants, to, he, he, he thinks fitness is the right way to go. And, and I, I would agree, you know, the fitness and boutique fitness is a hot, hot business to get into. So he wants a specific fitness brand, although he doesn't know what it is, but he wants me to propose brands that might fit. Well, the first step I do when I work with people is I do a territory check to ensure that it's actually even available in their area. Because there's nothing worse than me by accident telling somebody or getting them excited about a brand and finding out, you know, it's not available in their area. It's been sold already. Or they're not ready to, like in California, if a brand is mostly East or West Coast, they might not be ready to go to California yet. So uh, clearly they wouldn't be available. So this particular CPA, you know, he had a little bit of arrogance to him. You know, he's been quite successful and he goes, well, I'll decide what brand I want to go with. And he was making it difficult for the VP of franchise development for this one particular brand he really liked. He was making it difficult for this uh, lady to connect. He was calling her at off times and he wasn't necessarily responding to her when she was reaching out. And she, you know, and, and she called me and she said, you know, you know, Lance, I don't know if this is going to work. So there's this attitude from some people out there that I'm the prospective franchisee. I'll decide who I'm picking. And maybe in some cases there are some brands that are looking for a hot check, so to speak. They just want their next good franchisee, so they'll ignore the attitude. Those blow up later because personality-wise, it's never going to work. It's like that lust in a relationship, or you know, the honeymoon phase weighs, uh, you know, it uh, it wears off, right? Absolutely. So uh, the bottom line with this gentleman, I had to call him. I, I'm I'm the advocate. I'm I'm really in between everybody, and and I am the advocate, and I go back to. The, the prospect or the candidate. And I said, hey, Mr. CPA, let me just clue you in right really quickly so you understand. You need to change your attitude and your behaviors right now because you're going to blow this thing. And of course, he gave me attitude back like he was in shock. Who are you to talk to me like this? I'm a successful guy that's even older than you, Lance, and I'm 53. And I said, I'm just telling you, they've already sold hundreds of franchises. They don't need you at all. They need somebody that's going to fit in their culture, that's going to that's going to help the brand and help themselves to be successful. You can't call people at all hours of the night or text them or whatever it might be. You're not even you 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 barely started the process at this point. Have some respect for the process and trust the process because you right, have right. to go through all of the process. Trusting the process is a, is a big deal. That's uh uh, in every facet of life, there's a lot of people that mistake th that part and don't don't take time to understand that. How important um, 
is someone having a passion for the industry that they're interested in franchising or is it more important to choose one that has had radical success like where does that lie i mean obviously you want to have both i i, I get yeah. that yep. but um on that spectrum what's what are some of the most important things f for people interested in franchising well that also goes back to the original questions i asked him in the very first phone call you know i'll ask questions if i'm talking to a, a gentleman and i know he's married I'll ask about his spouse. Is his spouse going to participate in the decision-making process? Now, when all when it's possible, I like to deal with them together. It's it's very rare to get husband and wife or a couple on the phone at the same time in every single phone call. Um, so, but the bottom line is it goes back to that call because those are the notes that I take and I put in my digital file for later. And I refer back to them because there's a lot, like I had a lady the other day, she said, the most important t thing to me is that I find a worthwhile brand. Well, what does that mean? Now I have to dig deeper. Is it on the financial side? Is it that it can benefit the community? Is that it, you know, it benefits, uh, um, you know, a certain gender? Is it something that she has to feel good about? Is it a nonprofit? So really to answer your question, it, it, it comes down to, Passion is a wonderful thing. We all want that energy that passion gives all of us because we feel good about what we're doing. But at the end of the day, and I've I've heard your shows before, right? And at the end of the day, you know, passion doesn't always produce the profits. There right. are people that run nonprofits and they're passionate and they're not able to make a sizable income, and that's okay if you're happy. Right. And and at the end of the day, I mentioned earlier, I'm helping a gentleman I know from high school. It's all about profits for him. He can get passionate. He admitted that his career for 28 years, if I told you the industry, which for confidentiality, I probably shouldn't. But if I, you know, in the industry that he's in, it's a boring industry, a really boring industry. He even laughed. He goes, look what I did for 28 years. I made it fun, but it's a boring industry. So I don't really care what you put me in. I want it to be highly profitable and, and, a, and a fast or a quick ROI. I want to be able to get my capital back quickly because, you know, some franchises, you can get your money back in a year. Right. And other franchises is going to take you five years. Well, I think that's a big part of the objective. What, what's their, what's your objective? What are you looking to get out of this thing? Yes. Uh, you know, are you looking to one, you know, accumulate a bunch of franchise, sell them off, uh, are you looking for a residual profit from from the business that each year you're taking a certain amount of money from it every single year? Um, because a, a, a good franchise business, my guess is that can become some level of an annuity for the for the owner. And absolutely right. So I, I think that's an, a, the important part um, when when you kind of uh, I guess guide people through. And I, and I was just thinking about like how. Um, important this is like on their objective because and i guess that ends up deciding what role they take in the business meaning if i'm let's say i, I you know i'm a sports guy let's say i uh want to own one of these um exercise um uh, training places and you know i really love training and i, I you know i i know i want to be there every single day and and i want to be involved in it but it doesn't make quite as much money as owning 15 Dunkin' Donuts, right? right. And, and I can put the staff in place. Um, when people call, and I'm sure you get this all the time, like I, I, I used to think the only thing that would matter was I've got to want to be there every single day. I was for years and years and years. Uh, like I love football. That's my business. That's I coach high school football. I, that's the business I run and camps and all the stuff associated with it. And then I start, there are other things that started to pique my interest because um, I do love football, but there became like extension things. Like I never thought I'd be interested in products. Right. But we built the product, you know, and we started yeah. selling that. And I never thought we would be interested. I, I never thought I would even, but I liked the, uh, Multiple revenue streams. Right. So, and, and the different areas of it. How, how do you tell people like, let's figure out 
what in the end is going to be best for your family? And do you, do you change, like if someone comes to you and says, I want to do this, do you ever change them and then re-guide them in a different direction? You know, because they thought they wanted this. I said, I want to be in fitness. And he said, okay, well, do you want to be in fitness or do you want to have, you know, something that could uh, be in an industry like that that makes you more money? How, yeah. how do you go and frame that with people? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it. The, the answer is, first of all, again, going back to the first call, I dive really, really deep. And in the follow-up, as I present brands, well, let's back up. The first phone call, one of the questions I ask for, uh, I actually ask permission. And I say, you know, like in your situation, you know, Dave, I know you told me these are your parameters, A, A B, C, D, E. What if I presented you some brands that are sort of outside your parameters? They still fit your investment level. But I, I kind of see that there's a couple of brands that I have and industries that I represent within those brands that you might not even be aware of. So you're very specific that you're interested in restaurants or fitness or this. But how about you give me permission to present other things that I think are suitable? Pretty much 95% of the people say, Lance, you know what? Whatever you think is best, present. Now, the, the key is this, and this isn't anything, I'm not divulging any trade secrets as I tell you this, but when I go to present to people, there's everybody talks about mindset today. Fear being the biggest problem with everybody. Right. And, and, and you know, someone's again comfort zone could be one way, you know, could be huge or it could be tiny. And and the level of risk goes obviously with that. Who's willing to take the risk and who needs an absolutely proven brand? So, you know, for me, I introduce people to brands they never even thought they would have been introduced to. I mentioned to you earlier, crime scene cleanup. If I meet a Amazing. owner operator type, it could have been a restaurant manager, it could have been a paramedic, first responder. I mentioned restaurant manager because it's a lot of restaurant managers that own that franchise because they're empathetic, they used to work in long hours. But you know, crime scene cleanup is re recession proof, sadly. Uh, I mean, it is what it is, it happens all the time. And, uh, you know, and it's it's suicides and it's, uh, you know, um, death in people's in homes. But nobody would ever call me and say, I want a crime scene cleanup business. That's me. <laughs> that's me getting to it. You know, you mentioned an annuity earlier. That that salon business that I mentioned, a uh, guy I know that has 19 of these franchise salons. You know what his net income is e on each salon? And you can do the quick math times 19. 75 grand. That's incredible. And it cost him 160000 to open each of the salons, got some loans in the beginning, didn't want to use all his cash, wanted to leverage, you know, as, as my uh, wealthy, eccentric uh, pseudo uncle once told me with TGI Fridays, he's the first one that told me OPM. So what's OPM? He goes, well, when you have money like me, people are willing to give you more money. So use other people's money. How, how how hard is that for a new franchisee to to get capital um, going into the business? Um, I know sometimes like and like I said, I, I, I don't know that much about it, but I know that sometimes um, they won't fund you to pay the franchise fees uh, the initial franchise fee, but they'll fund you for your operation, your operational expenses. Your, your, you know, maybe some working capital, maybe some of your build out stuff. How, yeah. how, how does that part of it work? So, so here's, here's what goes on today. And it's, uh, you know, there might be some slight adjustments based on industry, but we're, we're fortunate in the franchise world. Franchising is so important to the U.S. economy that the Small Business Association, even through the pandemic, I have multiple people that are closing on deals or closed on deals and, and had, opportunities for small business, you know, SBA loans. So the SBA to give additional incentives now, they're waiving the first six months payment payments, not deferring. They're gone as part of the deal. Someone, you know, they're, they're, they're paid for you, your first six months of payments. But to answer your question, Dave, um, typically you're going to put 25% down your down payment uh, you know, the average franchise these days, well, well, I have tons of franchises under $100,000 that I got a franchise at $70,000, $75,000 max, home-based, 
There are people that make a million dollars a year working out of their house doing this business. That we'll talk about another time. Yeah, I definitely a typical, <laughs> a typical franchise, about 250000 on average, typical franchise. So 25%, 62.5 is what you're going to have to prove that you have. Plus, you have to prove that that's not your last $62,000. You have to have some other money in the bank, depending on do you have a spouse? Who's going to make income you know, to pay this payment while you're new? At, at When you open a franchise, you're not necessarily cash flowing from day one. You could, but typically you're not. You're going to need working capital for the first year, depending on the brand, six months to a year. So to answer your question, 25% down is the norm. The franchise fee does count. So if the franchise fee is, you know, 25,000, 50,000, the franchise fee, you will probably pay that first because your financing will not be done. And that'll go into the loan and count as your cash injection. That's very interesting. And, and going back to the beginning, like when you went to, and you built up TGIF, um, uh, which obviously almost everybody would know as as one of the the most successful original franchises. It was, <laughs> uh, it was right, and that, that's why I want to talk about it. So, um, it, it it really was. If you're going back to, I guess maybe the '90s, I would say, and you know, in, in the early 2000s, like I remember, we used to go, you know go to TJF for happy hour, even absolutely. And now people don't even go to TJF at all as much no. anymore. And so sustainability, how, what are some, do you think, are some of the keys to um, being able to make a, a franchise continue to sustain over the long term? What, and and yeah. um, obviously it was a huge success and then it could become a, a, a failure. But how do you sustain, you know, for the long term as, as a, a franchise? Well, you know, another another great question, you know. So let me give you an example, Apple, Apple, which isn't a franchise. But remember, most people remember the story that Steve Jobs was essentially kicked out of Apple and then eventually brought back. But there was a point where Apple was in trouble. So one of the arguably best U.S. brands ever is Apple. Is that fair to say? Most people Apple, listening? Yes. It's one of the biggest success stories yet. Yet in their history, they had some serious hiccups where they couldn't find themselves and they fixed it and they got back on track. TGI Fridays, I can tell you for 100% certainty, because I was there, um, I used to represent our brand and would go to Dallas where uh, corporate TGI Fridays was based. And, uh, you know, R&D kitchen, see what's coming for the seasonal menu. And I represented our big franchise. And I'll never forget, TGI Fridays had fresh cut fries that most people would remember. Fresh cut homemade French fries that were fantastic. I'll never forget we were in the test kitchen. And the chef hands me a fry and said, taste that fry. And I tasted it and I go, it's pretty good. He goes, almost as good as ours, right? And I go, well, yeah, almost as good as ours. Why? What, what are you doing? He goes, well, that's a frozen fry. That's going to be our new fry. And I'm telling you, that was symptomatic of the downfall of Fridays because the leadership, the top two guys at Fridays when I was there, we're amazing. We're amazing. And one, one of them left, then the second one left. So now new leadership came in and Chili's, Applebee's, Fridays, in my opinion, went chasing each other down the cost cutting path. How do we save money? How do we cut labor? And it didn't work. And then the likes of Cheesecake Factory were born at the time, although they're having their issues today. Right. You know, in the in the old days, they were known as a quality brand. Outback in the old days, good quality brand for what you got. Um, but again, leadership is what keeps any brand on track and keeps a brand focused. Um, you know, we have a, a a now famous sign franchise in our portfolio. You know, been around thirty years. One of the best brands ever in franchise. You can't even get it in most territories. And, uh, you know, so it's all about leadership and consistent leadership. A lot of because franchising is so successful, you know, private equity groups today, they're looking at their financial instruments and their financial investments, stocks, bonds, what have you. And then after that, what do they look at? Real estate. Maybe at the same time, they're looking at both. What do they do after that? Franchising. You know, Wingstop. Wingstop, when I was with Wingstop, shortly thereafter, they were sold. 
you know, Roar Capital, huge, huge private equity group, gobbling up restaurants left and right, predictable cash flow, just like you said earlier. Right. You know, you can take a smaller brand, inject some capital and repeat that royalty stream all over the country. Continue to support your franchisees with the best and the latest technology. Wingstop lost little to no business through the pandemic. They were already set up for takeout and to go and everything. I have a young brand with one location in downtown Atlanta, a cheesesteak brand, the hottest brand I've, I think I've ever seen. Their business went up through the pandemic and they already did insane sales, insane sales. That's interesting. So there's there's opportunities galore, but all these examples I'm giving you with Wingstop, with the my cheesesteak brand, it's all about leadership and vision and understanding the future, you know, and that's, you got to stay on track and stay focused and give your customers, fill the need that what you're, of what your customers want. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and in cl closing, I'd like you to, how can people reach out to you and get more information, you know, uh, from you um, right. and, and get directly in contact with you? Well, my website is Ion Franchising, I O N Franchising.com. Uh, on there, as a matter of fact, that free assessment I, I mentioned is on there. Scroll down a little bit, it'll say free assessment, click on it, take you 10, 15 minutes. You get a nice report on yourself, and, and I'll see it as well, and, and I'll help you. But uh, I'm, I'm on social media, I'm on Facebook, I'm also on Instagram, uh, most active on Instagram and Facebook, and, and I'm happy to help. Look, I talk to people that, don't end up buying a franchise because we agree that it's not necessarily even right for them now. But truly, you know, if anybody wants to have their own business, there's I have a franchise for everybody in every investment level. And and we can talk about it. But there are people that I talk to for years that for whatever reason don't commit. And that's OK. I'm, I'm working with a guy that's active duty military right now. He gets out uh, next year. And he's committed to buying a franchise and we're already exploring now. And I have great deals for veterans. Oh, really? Well, yeah. I, and I think that's that's a diff the key is to be able to have um, the ability for anybody that has some sort of backing financially. Um, and the great thing about franchising uh, is, is definitely that you don't have to have millions of dollars accessible. There are different nope. levels. Uh, you just have have to have enough capital to find the right fit, and and, and go from there. Um, you know, they can go to ionfranchising.com, um, get your free assessment. You guys can you know reach out to me if you don't want to reach out to him directly. Five hundred brands, well, about five hundred and seventy five brands today. Five hundred and seventy brands today, um, and he started with one of the most famous. Uh, of all time uh, at uh, TGI Fridays, which is uh, TGIF, which is just, um, it, it's fantastic. Uh, it's, it's been great having you on. Anything you want to leave uh, our our listeners with? You know, don't let don't let fear be your, uh, you know, your blocker. Nothing ventured, nothing gained is one of my favorite expressions. And then my other classic is Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. There you go. Uh, make sure you guys go and, and keep coming back to the Success for Life podcast. It'll be up there shortly. Um, you can see you can see it on iTunes as well. Um, Lance, thanks so much for coming on. I really enjoyed. It. I, I learned a ton today. Um, thank you, Dave. And I'm sure everybody. My pleasure. Thank you.